the first thing you did was hand me your book that's that's it's your called it's your mother's fault, which says a lot about now what? It's yeah. your mother's fault. Now, now what? what? Okay, yeah, that's now that that's, we've identified now that we've it. identified that. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. So tell us a little bit about uh, about you and your story. And then I want to weave in some of the research on family estrangement and, and some tools that people can use. Sure. I think it's great. And okay. So let me start with the very beginning, which was going to therapy. Going to therapy at around the age of 26. So a little bit about me that is important was that I was a morbidly obese child who grew into a morbidly obese teenager. And by the time I was in high school, I was 265 pounds at five foot two. And then on February 9th, 1999, I went on the Atkins diet. And in the first four months, I lost 75 pounds. And 10 months later, I lost 125 pounds in 10 months. Wow. And it was extreme. And after that, I thought all of my problems should go away. <laughs> I've lost because right. my entire life, everyone said, if you would just lose weight, you have such a pretty face if you would just lose weight. So it felt like losing weight was going to be the answer to all of my problems. And it wasn't. Yeah, so there, there's a start there of oftentimes the thing that was going to be the answer to our problems that we go for isn't the answer, and then it it actually reveals the deeper problem or the deeper issue or the deeper stuck point when that the problems don't go away. It not only reveals deeper problems, it, it produces new ones. Mm. And in my case between my mother and I, there were new problems that were being produced. And what I had noticed was her attempts at trying to sabotage my weight loss efforts, her constant negative comments about her own body. That was something that I had experienced my entire life. And I began to see the correlation between the way I felt about myself the the size I had become and the modeling that I had received. And so I found myself responding or reacting to her rather in, in anger and wanting her to be different than she could be. And so then I went to therapy. And when I got into therapy, I began to process this relationship with my mother a little differently and noticed a lot of other dynamics, including her jealousy of the relationship that I had with my father, or rather the way that he loved me and maybe not her. So there were lots of different mother-daughter dynamics that were at play here that were very dysfunctional. And food in Italian culture is love. And if you've ever seen the memes about Italians just putting out a little something for a snack and the entire table is covered, this is my experience. We are always overfed. I now know that being overfed was also my mother's trauma response. I was say it's a trauma response, yeah. To mm -hmm. food insecurity mm -hmm. and the severity of it. In fact, I took a picture of her freezer. Um, a couple of weeks ago when I went and when I opened it, things were falling out. She lives alone at 75 years old and there were food falling out of her freezer. So she's still very much stuck in that trauma response. I didn't know, nor did I care to see it back then in my 20s because I was just so angry at her failure to be the mother that I had created in my mind of what she was supposed to be. And I also felt that losing the weight would equal the acceptance from her, the validation, the love that I never quite felt I received from her and it didn't, which yielded more pain for me. It's like, I'm now everything that you wanted me to be. And it's still not enough. So my therapist 
suggested that I... Hi, I'm Dr. Diana Hill. Thank you so much for joining me with Your Life in Process. And if you want more, if you're interested in applying these processes to your daily life, join me at my membership, More Life in Process. At More Life in Process, you will get meditations for you to practice at home. You'll get extra bits from the episode that maybe got recorded after the fact. You're going to get PDFs and handouts, things that you can use to apply your daily practice to your life. And I can't wait to see you there. $5 a month, $50 for the year. You can go to yourlifeinprocess.com to sign up. Move. When I was time for, I had gotten engaged and my now was Ben and I were looking for a home. And my therapist said, you should put some space between some distance, some physical distance between your mother and you, because I was living on the second floor. I mean, Italians, we buy three family homes and then someone's on every floor, right? So you'll find plates of food on the stairs when you come home. It's, it was great. I mean, I would give anything for chicken cutlets and broccoli rob on my stairs right now. And it had its own challenges as well. So I did. I moved about an hour away to uh, New York. And as I suspected, nobody ever really made the commute. So it was me and it still is me driving an hour down to Jersey to visit. And the relationship um, needed some space. What I had realized was I couldn't get well and be in relationship with my mother. And, And then I went to Italy after almost 10 years of not seeing my family, who most of, you know, second and third cousins, everyone still lives in Italy. So about a decade had passed and I went back to visit. And my mother is the oldest of eight who went to work at nine. So all of her siblings are still in Italy. Nobody else came to America but my mother. And she came here with two children by herself. And then they didn't have the resources to go back for 25 years. So it is a very tragic immigrant story of survival. So when I went back to Italy a couple of years ago, her sisters, I had one empty suitcase that they filled with like cheeses and hams and you name it. It was stuffed in my shoes. More food. And, more food. And, and more <laughs> Yeah. More food. Every time I, yeah. Sometimes I feel it's like it's all we have. Yeah. So her sisters said, will you bring this to your mother? Mm-hmm. And I said, of course, I'll bring it to my mother. I don't know where she lives because after, you know, my parents had um, challenges in their marriage and then they got divorced after 47 years. And so uh, during the estrangement, my mother relocated and I didn't know where she was. Mm-hmm. So I said, if she'll give you her address, I'll be more than happy to drop off the things. I have no problem doing that. And so I did. And it was a Saturday. I was on my way to see Six, the Broadway play, with a friend. And I said, let me drop this stuff off at at my mom's place, thinking that I would just be dropping the bag off and just pulling away. I left my car running. I didn't think that she would see me or would want to see me. And when I pulled in, I was going to the backyard and a door just swung open. And she's like, Julia, I can hug you. And I said, sure, mama, you can hug me. And then I hugged her and she's like 4'11 and her body just went limp in my arms. And I said, I know, I know this is a lot. It's a lot, mom. It's a lot. It's okay. It's okay. It's a lot here. Here I am again, soothing her because she's inconsolable at this point. And I have to feel, I feel like I have to keep it together. And then I I quickly, I said, I have this stuff for you from, from Zia Nunzia and Zia Malia. They, they put this together for you. And she's like, oh, wonderful. Will you bring it upstairs? Her apartment was on the second floor and I went upstairs and her kitchen looked just like my childhood home. So I was like having this like (gasps) moment of like, oh my God, Julia, just stay focused, get to the fridge. Where's the fridge? Identifying the fridge, staying present, putting the cheeses and everything in the fridge and then it's quickly just getting out of there because it was so overwhelming. Focusing on my box breathing 
And I went back downstairs and she asked me if I would come back again because I told her I needed to go. I was, I was heading into the city for a show. And uh, two weeks later, I did. I did go back again. And now it's been about uh, a little over a year uh, that we've been reconnected. And I've been seeing her probably on a weekly basis and I talk to her about once or twice a week on the phone for all of about, I don't know, 90 seconds. Yeah. There's yeah. not a lot to say. I remember you saying at one point when we were talking about your mom, like that, that sometimes it's 17 minutes. <laughs> how long you stay for. It's like a high intensity interval workout. I'm going to go in for 17. That's all I got. And it's all, all out. Um, I, I'd love to, I'd love to go back and, and, and kind of chunk this into different parts because there's the, there's the experience of early childhood and your relationship with your mom and then getting to the point of clarity of, I need a break. Then there's what happened for you on that break. I mean, 10 years. And um, what it's like to be estranged from your mom for 10 years. And then, then what happened for you to, to reunite and then the sort of the why and how you've gone about that. Um, we had Brad Stolberg on and he talked about order, disorder, and then new order. Like that you're creating a new order, a new way of relating to your mom, even though your mom has not changed one iota. Her, her apartment's Correct. the same as your childhood home. She's, re she's the same. Uh, and just to, you know, I did a little bit of sleuthing to learn more about estrangement because it actually is something that happens to more people than people say is happening because there's so much stigma and shame associated with family estrangement. There was this really large study done by uh, Carl Palmer who studied over, I think, 1,300 people and found that 27% of Americans have estrangement in their family. That's like a quarter plus Americans. And of those that have it, that are experiencing it, most of them say that it's something that bothers them, but they don't feel is fixable. And then there's this whole other study that um, he did where he started to look at like the stories of people that are estranged and the stories of people who have re reconciled. And the stories are very similar to yours. Like what is it that's causing the estrangement? It's things like mental health issues. It's narcissism. It's boundaries that are repeatedly crossed and you can't handle them being crossed anymore. And then there's also um, the, the accumulation over time that then just leads to the I'm done. <laughs> Like he called he called the volcanic effect. Like it's been it, it's been going on like this since I was five years old, and now I'm in my twenties, which is actually a very common time for people to have estrangement from their parents. Now I'm in my twenties, and it I can't do it anymore. And for the twenty year old, in some ways, it's almost easier for them to leave than for for the parent because you can go build your life, and you don't necessarily need your mom in the same way. So let's, let's go back to, let's go back to like the, the accumulating stressors between you and your mom that led to the decision to take the break and, and how you went, how you did that and your <clears throat> thoughts about it now as an adult. Well, it was volcanic. That's yeah. for sure. It was definitely volcanic. Mm -hmm. So my parents, again, after 47 years of marriage, of miserable marriage, I might add, uh, decided to divorce and still live together through the process. So she was in my old bedroom and he was in their old room. And she had five locks on the inside of the door. I mean, it was so, so contemptuous between them wow. that it's comical now. For me, when I when I share some of these stories, like it, I know that it's going to be shocking and I hope that you can see some of the humor in, in this too. So I was at my parents' house. My father had received uh, divorce letters and both of my parents were illiterate. So I went to private school starting in fifth grade. They took me out of public school number 18 in Patterson, New Jersey and put me in private school. And then I went to an all girls Catholic high school in New Jersey and my private school education was paying dividends in the fifth grade. That's when I took over the family finances and my father would have me writing the checks because they couldn't. So 
I was helping translate the paperwork that he received from her attorney. And she came home. And when she came home, she said, oh, you help your father. Mm. And I was like, mom, uh, of course I'm going to help my father. And I'm going to help you too. And I went into the kitchen where she was, you know, having a little I incident. And I put my hand on her back and I said, mom, I'm, I'm always going to help you. And I'm always going to help daddy. And she said, something, 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 and you might still be married. And I looked at the giant fruit bowl on the kitchen table, and I just grabbed an orange, and I threw it at volcano the Volcano erupted. <laughs> and the volcano <laughs> yeah. erupted. It's been in there this whole time. Yeah. And mm -hmm. she had, like, all these little plants, like statues of Jesus and Mary. And she's like, la Madonna. Mm -hmm. And I'm like. Tuesday, old diablo, like you are the devil. Mm. And she went into her room and locked all of the doors. And 15 minutes later, the police show up and they are here for a domestic. Oh, great. And I said, you're here for a domestic. What domestic? Your mother called regarding a domestic and an assault. And thank goodness my father was there. Because I had thrown an orange. I said, I threw an orange at the windowsill and Mary is now broken into a million pieces in the sink and I'm cleaning it up. I was cleaning it up. Yeah. Raise your hand if you have there. not thrown an orange. <laughs> 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 when you got really mad, whether it's an orange or it's something else. Something. <laughs> right. Yeah. Just said yeah. that impulse. There was no yeah. impulse control in the yeah, moment. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because she so had yeah. poked me so yeah. hard. She knows yeah. where to poke. And I'm always... And I'm always helping them if medical bills, mm -hmm. doctor's appointments, anything that comes in the mail, they can't read it, I'm there. They can't write it, I'm there. Advocating against the unions that they worked for when they were in the factories. I mean, I have been their attorney and their financial advisor since I was in fifth grade. So it was just, to me, just so hurtful. And then the next day, she went down to the Patterson Police Department and filed an assault charge on me and subsequently had me in the court system for two years. Oh, Julia. Wow. Yeah. Did you, like, what, what about shame around that? I mean, did you, did people know this was happening for you? Were you keeping it, like, you know, a well, secret? Well, I like, mean. Or what was the external, like, what was the storyline that you were telling others? Well, everyone sort of knew. Okay. My, the people closest to me knew that my mother was unwell, knew that my mother um, exhibited very borderline features and knew that the cops were being called or she was threatening an overdose. And they knew, they mm -hmm. just knew that um, her hatred for my father was greater than her love for me. And she would do anything to make him pay for what she endured with him. Yeah. So every time we went to court, my dad came and the judge would say the same thing. Uh, Mrs. Prezu, so would you like to drop the charges against your daughter? And she would say, no, she's going to pay. Mm -hmm. After two years of being in court, the judge dismissed the charges wow. after two years. Wow. Wow. And, you know, folks that maybe are listening that don't have such a extreme example of estrangement, there are some threads there that maybe they do relate to, which is one, the intractable story and, the, and then how that story can build and become um, it, 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 like it, it's obviously it was harming your mom to have to go to court and be in that place and be in such a, you know, feel such hatred or feel so defensive or whatever it was that she was feeling, but she could not let it go. She could not put she it couldn't. down. And whatever that story is, like the, the volcano erupts and then, and then the division happens. And because it's so, it is so painful, people dig themselves deeper and deeper and deeper into it. And that, and then you can stay there for a long time. You got yourself out enough to do the healing that you needed to do and become a therapist. Obviously you've, 
in 10 years, there was a lot that happened for you internally. What did you do? What was happening internally for you to be able to eventually bring the cheese back to her apartment? <laughs> like what was that? <laughs> I was really doing a lot of recovery work. I've, I've been in therapy consistently with the same therapist since I was, uh, since I was 26. And I worked through a lot of the anger and the self-hatred because I had internalized the contempt. My mother's contempt became my own contempt for myself. Mm -hmm. And it was no way. I was, everything looked good on the outside. People were like, wow, Julia's on that crackhead diet. Have you seen her? Because I was walking every all day on my house. <laughs> for all, all the cheese. All the I cheese. Mean, all the cheese <laughs> and eggs. Finally, I barely touch cheese these days, but all the cheese that sustained me Aww. and contributed to a 125 pound weight loss in 10 months, what I would give for those cheese days again, really. <laughs> and so the self-hatred that I had internalized, I had to work through. And once I, I got through the, the fake forgiveness, because again, people will say, it, the, but that's your mother. And, and especially in Italian, in Italian mm -hmm. culture, I mean, it, there's no greater sin after divorce than not talking to your mother. And um, I committed both of those crimes. So everyone was like, that's your mother, Julia. What are you going to do? That's your mother. You have to forgive your mother. And, and I don't disagree that you know, forgiveness is, is, is for me. It wasn't for my mother. And I don't know that, that she ever receives it. And I'll never know that because we can't have those conversations. However, I feel like once I got over myself, once I got over my self-hatred, once I got over myself, my demons, the way that I abused Julia because of the way that she was treated, I had space to consider Carmela's story mm -hmm. and the past five or so years has really been focused on considering Carmela's story and making more space. And not that it's ever my burden or responsibility to, to fix my mother's trauma, but I, I needed to, I always understood the story and I always understood the hardship, hardships, but I felt resentful because they had hardship and I could never compete with their hardship. I didn't, my father left Italy at 14 and worked in Libya until Muammar Gaddafi chased the Italian immigrants out. And then he ended up in Stuttgart, Germany. And then finally in America, I could never compete with their hardship. I mean, I went to private school and I had food that was falling out of the freezer. But there's two, there's two things that you said there that are really important. The first one is the reason why you made the break from your mom and also the, and also the, the reason why you were willing to move towards forgiveness was for you, was for you. And in the, um, in the reconciliation study that I was, that I was reading through, that was the number one reason why people reconciled was not for their family member. It was for themselves. And to have that be, this is going to set me free. It's not to set your mom free it's because you're, you're not in charge of that, but to set yourself free. And then when you, when you did that, when you take, took the space for yourself, it allowed you to probably also to get your nervous system into more a socially engaged, compassionate state to be able to have compassion for your mom because your mom was totally poking at um, comp competition drive and and the need for you to be defensive to to defend and so you needed the space to not to not have to defend to be able to, to take care of yourself so that you could then feel safer i mean i don't think i don't know how safe you feel in her presence now but um <laughs> to be able to get to get to that place so that that's very important one you did it for you two you took the time that you needed to take and uh and then you started to shift to a little bit of perspective taking the other thing that I, that I heard from you when we've talked about your mom in the past is utter and complete acceptance that your mother is not going to change one iota. Like, no, she's not changing. 
And that's, wow. that's a tall order because that is a hard place to be in. Cause we just want them, like, we just want them to apologize or them to see this, this, that, and the other, and they're not going to necessarily do that. And can you still be willing to be in a relationship with them if they do not change? And what is the, the minimum that you're willing to like tolerate, you know, uh, because they're not going to give you, they're not going to give you what you want, but there has to be some boundaries too around it. So tell us about how you reentered and, and, and also what you're doing now, like your so, 17 minute workout. So, and I think the boundaries piece was, is another yeah. important thing to talk yeah. about yeah, yeah. on the road to estrangement. I mean, we had mm -hmm. the volcanic eruption, which should have been enough, but prior to that, during their separation, she would call me to talk about my father and my brothers and anybody else that I loved in a negative way. Right. And I would say, hey, mom, uh, I love you. And please don't talk about my dad like that because it's still my dad. And mom, if you keep talking about my dad like that, I'm just going to have to hang up the phone. And then, you know, well, fine. I just won't say anything at all. Yes. You know, it goes back into, right. you know, more gaslighting. And then eventually I hung up the phone. Right. Consequences. I There's told you what the consequence was going to be. You walked over it and therefore you experienced the consequence. That's a boundary. Right. And you know? that's a boundary. Yeah. So the boundary is now the, the regulating of the nervous system. This is really important. The, the, you know, the moving to out of the inner city into um, a very a rural uh, country place that I live in, the, the singing bowls, the sound bath meditations, the humming, the countless hours of lectures from Ram Das and Thich Nhat Hanh and Jack Kornfield and walking for hours. I mean, I would spend eight hours a day with these headphones on because I was in so much emotional distress and there was nowhere to go. Mm -hmm. You have to move it through you. You have yeah. to move it through you. And, and, and when I regulated, I remember being in a sound bath meditation where she was playing these shells that sounded like amniotic fluid. And in that space, I had a vision of being in the womb. And it was a restless environment. And I thought to myself, oh, man, no wonder why you have such difficulty sleeping. Carmela didn't get any rest. She was working 3.30 to midnight on the assembly line in the factory, coming home to three children and a husband who didn't think he had to babysit his kids while she took us to the rag shop where she picked out the trending pattern and then bought the fabric to sew my clothes and then made the bread and the pasta and the sauce from scratch and made sure not to feed him something that wasn't respectable enough on a Sunday that would get her severely punished by my father. So when I think about that moment in the womb, when I was there, there was no rest for my mother. I don't think she was able to sleep very well with that amount of risk. And there's the cracking open mm -hmm. that was happening because what I had to do was get her out of character that I had put her in based on how I thought my mother was supposed to behave, based on what I had observed from my friends, from what I had seen on TV. And I'm a third culture kid. I'm the first American born. And things are done very differently here. And my own expectations of what my mother was supposed to look like had to die yeah. in order for me to see Carmela. And that is what Ramdas taught me when he took his own father out of character so that he could see him as a human being. And that really cracked me open. And I remember that night after the sound bath, I had the best sleep ever because I was able to tell Julia that she's safe now. And that she's in a cozy bed and there's her corgi and it's so warm here and you're okay and you can rest. And I had some, I've been having great sleep, I can say, because of that realization that I cut ties with my mother's restlessness that I had inherited in utero. 
So that's, that's part of the healing, right? Is being able to see the consequences of her experience on me outside of what she had done to me developmentally. Well, I, I hear you saying that. And I also just hear you, there's like a sweet sweetness that you're feeling towards her in, in what she did to create a home for you to, you know, to sew, to sew the clothes and go to work and, and how little resources, emotional or um, financial or just physical resources she had available for her to live any other way. And, and so, yeah, her nervous system, uh, you know, true threat, and then how that changes our, our behavior as when we're, when we're under threat. So it's both the putting her, like putting her in a position of you being able to have more understanding because you have space from the chronic assault that was coming at you. You had to have that right. space. You had to, you, sometimes when I do like a compassion exercises with clients, I'll be like, where do you want to put the person? Do you want to put them across the room or do you want to put them across the lawn or do you need to put them like across town to practice this compassion exercise? <laughs> and they'll be like across town, maybe in another country. Okay, we'll start there. And, and you had to do that, put her, put her in a really distant spot to be able to generate those seeds of compassion for yourself and for her. And then you can slowly, as they germinate and they get stronger, maybe move a little closer to her. And for some people, it may never be reconciliation. It may be I'm just moving closer to her in my own psyche, in my own being. I'm able to welcome her in and offer her compassion in my, in my visualization. It's not actually in my life, either because they've passed or because the abuse has been so harmful, sexual, physical, emotional abuse, that you really don't want it to have them back in your life. And so that's a, just an important thing to say too, that not everyone yes. is going to re reconcile. It's not best for everybody. And for some people, it really is healing to be able to say, wow, I can be in her presence and not be in that, you know, as intense fight or flight. Fight or flight. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I'm not in fight or flight. I'm not waiting to react to her anymore. I don't feel threatened by her because I trust myself. So the more seeds of compassion and seeds of forgiveness that I gave to Julia, mm -hmm. the more I had for her. And then more memories would come back. And I know clients often talk about the memory block. They don't remember childhood. They can't remember. And for me, the more space the more memories mm -hmm. and the more memories, the more compassion. So let me tell you about the chicken soup real quick. Okay. Another food She story. would always have, <laughs> she, always, there's always something on the stove, always something on the stove. So she said, Julia, do me a favor and stir the chicken soup. I have to go do these chores and these errands. And I said, sure, no problem. And every time I went to stir the soup, I ate some of it. I ate the entire chicken, Yeah, Diana. I ate the entire chicken. And the chicken was like, you know, a normal what chicken is supposed to look like, not like the Purdue 10 pounder yeah. that, that I, I buy sometimes for myself. It was like just a, just a small whole chicken that every time you stirred it, it some broke apart and I ate the whole thing. And when she came home, there was just a chicken carcass in the soup. And I remember when that memory came to me, the deep sobbing that began as I imagined what she felt like when there was no more food to give to the family of five. Like that was for a family of five to eat. And I had eaten all of it. And I would... I would hear her say, non ce la faccio più, non ce la faccio più, which means I can't take it anymore. I can't take it anymore. And I sobbed so deeply for her that night that that memory came back because I can only imagine the despair and the helplessness of a mother unable to feed her family the way she thought she was going to. And furthermore, the wrath that she would feel from my father because of it, because his window of tolerance was closed as well. It's so interesting that that's where that took you. Cause I felt 
sadness for you as a kid that that was the one place that you knew how to get comfort. Like that was the only place that you were getting comfort from those little stirs of soup and a, and a bit of chicken. Like you were, you were trying to feed yourself that you could something that you could not get fed, obviously from your mom. And that's right. Like even a whole chicken doesn't, mm, doesn't hit the spot. Like that, that spot is endless. You could put five chickens in there and it's not going to feel full. Clearly like that, yeah. 265 yeah. pounds yeah. at 18 yeah. years old. Yeah. So like 20 chickens, it's it like, and, and the, but that's the only one you were taught. That's where love is, is, you know, through food, but then my also, mother's love. Yeah. Your mother's specifically. love. Specifically. Yeah. But then you also weren't, yeah, you weren't getting it through, through her. And the another aspect of in the womb, I mean, so much of this attachment stuff is pre-verbal. It is like what's happening in the womb. It's what's happening before you're even are having language. Like, is your mom picking you up and comforting you? Or is your mom shoving a bottle in your face to make you stop crying, right? Those, those early um, experiences of attachment that probably weren't happening for you because your mom had so, so much scarcity. She had to work so hard. She was feeding that family of five. And some of it's like, it is what it is. It's not, it's no one's fault in any of this. You were all trying to it, figure it, out. Right. There's no blame here. Yeah. It's this and it's that. But yeah. she would boast about, you know, um, meatballs, smashing up meatballs and putting meatballs and pasta in a blender and feeding it to me. She would boast about how much I would eat. <laughs> I was 90 pounds in kindergarten. Mm -hmm. oh, dear. I mean, it, yeah. The trickle down effect of the trauma and what I'm still having to be reminded of every time I see myself in certain ways. Right. Because I went back to a yoga, I went to a yoga studio that had mirrors. I haven't been to a gym oh, yeah. with mirrors since yeah. before the pandemic. So here it comes again. And I'm like faced with the mirror and I'm like, oh, look at that. No, that's not good. That. And I came home from that class and I just sobbed and I said, I'm so sorry. I'm doing this to you again. I'm so sorry I did this to you again. And it's, it's all of it starts with the, the meatballs in the blender. I didn't have a chance mm -hmm. at having an appropriate or healthy relationship with myself or food. And because I was shamed for what my father would often shame me for how much I was eating. My mother would shame me for not taking more food from her. Right. My not taking more food from her was rejection. Taking food from my father was disgust. And it was constantly battling these two forces and in me at the table because my brothers are so much older. They weren't really around. It was like I was an only child in some sense, you know. Mm -hmm. So fast forward to today and how do I manage today still with food, right? So when I'm in the mood for some really great Italian that nobody else can make like my mother I say, you know, especially on a Sunday, I say, I call her on a Sunday morning and I say, did you make sauce today? And she says, yes. And I said, okay, I'll be there at one o'clock because we always eat dinner at one o'clock in the afternoon on Sundays. And it's like a five hour ordeal with many courses. And I remember the first Sunday dinner that she prepared for me. I mean, she made everything that I like. Everything. She didn't skip. At, and then she sends me home. <laughs> With all this food that I then distribute to the neighborhood because I don't want to be 265 pounds again. I love the food. It's so good. I can't stop eating it. And and I have to give it away so that I have boundaries in place. And And then the newest thing that I'm doing, and this happened just about two or three weeks ago, we were sitting out on her porch as she um, smoked a cigarette post-op, you know, <laughs> God forbid she put that down. No, she's not going to change. Don't change her. <laughs> Don't try. <laughs> you know, or she'll just like the windows cracked this much in the kitchen and she's at the kitchen. So, and, and you're like, you oh. can't get the smell out of you. Yeah, I remember being diagnosed with, with, uh, asthma due to a secondhand smoke and my father's like these doctors don't know what the hell they're talking about <laughs> julia let's get out of here right like no accountability for it so well, anyway we're sitting outside on the deck and she's having a cigarette and she's very childlike you know i'm looking at her and i see i mean we have severe emotional developmental delay she's a, she's a toddler she's a toddler she has 
They say she went to third grade. I don't even believe that she had that much formal education. And she worked overtime every day to make sure that each one of her children could go to private school because we lived in the inner city and the schools were no good. So the sacrifices that she made, nobody's going to take that away from her. And so we're sitting on the porch and she's telling me some story about, I don't know, I can't even remember what it is, but she was smiling as she looked at me. She was making eye contact and smiling. And I was so aware of how uncomfortable I was looking at her. Mm -hmm. I can make eye contact with anybody, nobody. I mean, there's really any, but nobody that I've ever come across where I felt uncomfortable making eye contact with them until Carmela started making eye contact and smiling. And I was like, oh, this is new. This is new. I'm not used to these eyes. And so internally, the dialogue is, Julia, just breathe, just breathe, just rewrite the history. We're rewriting the history. Soft eyes, smiles from your mother. Receive soft eyes and smiles from your mother. Pre-verbal. Receive soft eyes and smiles from your mother, Julia. And I did. We can't talk about anything. When we reunited after 10 years, she said, she calls me up and says, you want to come over on Saturday? I made your favorite chicken. And then there's a part of me that says, like, how do you know I even eat chicken? Like, you haven't talked to me. How do you know I still eat chicken? I don't know if she knows what I do for a living. She's never been to the house that I live in now. I don't know if she knows I wrote a book. I don't know what she knows about me. And I won't offer her anything because this is where boundaries come in. Mm -hmm. Because I can't trust her and I don't feel emotionally or psychologically safe sharing anything that won't cause her to then react out of shame and then try to put me down in some way. I, I protect her and I protect myself. By saying nothing. Yes. you. But there's something impor- important about the way in which you're talking about those boundaries because they're flexible boundaries. They're not walls. You're right. opening them up when, you, when it's safe to receive new information, which is soft eyes and smile from your mother, which is really, really healing for you and exactly what you need. But you open them up just enough <laughs> to let that in. And then, you, you know, you hold them in places that are protective of you. If you have rigid boundaries with, with somebody, then you're never going to get that new learning experience. You're never going to see that maybe, maybe something is different in the here and now as we sit on this porch, even though I'm not expecting her to change, maybe there's possibility for change to happen. And if it happens, I'm all ears, all eyes open. I'm, I'm, we'll receive that. Uh, And, and as, as you talk about your mother as a toddler, that's also, I mean, not, you know, it's not in a sense of like, she's less than me, but also understanding no. where her capacities are. And so you're expecting right. the capacities that she can give you and not expecting something that she can't. That's painful, but also really relieving because you don't have right, to because make it happen anymore. It's not. Right. You know, and who am I to expect anything more from her? Yeah. What am I I'm setting myself up? And that's part of the death of the romanticization of what this mother is supposed to look like. This is the reality of what I have. I'll go there and she's doing word finding, you know, and it's, I can see the word backwards and I'm hesitant to uh, participate because she's like circles a word and she looks at me and she's smiling and I'm like, good. Uh, and then I can see a word and it's, and it's not only a, a long word, it's a backwards word at that, right? So then I, I said, let me just go for it. And I said, oh, there's one. And she goes, I like to take my time. And I said, you should. You should. This is so good for you, mom. I'm glad to see you doing this. And then I say, well, I got to go. Good to see you. And I leave and sometimes I leave and I cry the whole hour back home because I spent 17 minutes and it's a two hour drive. And sometimes um, I'm just at peace because I know that I can take what I need and leave the rest. 
And I also know that she can't give me what she never received. And I also know that in her shoes, I might have done the same things. Radical honesty, some of the defensiveness that I still have, some of the anger that I still come face to face with that shadow part of Julia. Maybe I would, too, have some reactions that people would frown upon and say that's not okay. And that's where you continue to break wide open because me, too. I don't always do my best work either. And it's no more of this, how could you do this to me? But more of this zooming so far out that I see her in post-World War II, Southern Italy, the oldest of eight who went to work at nine. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, when we can see the causes and conditions for our parents and the causes and conditions for ourselves. You know, that first, yeah. because then it's fake forgiveness, right? Yeah. If I don't see the causes and conditions for myself and I go right to her causes and conditions, it's not going to stick. Yeah. You can't skip yourself in this process. You've got to turn towards yourself and plant the seeds of compassion and forgiveness for yourself or it simply will not work. As the holidays come. Yeah. Think about, and, and that's the boundaries and, you know, everything's shifting always. So you think about how you can participate. And so, so last year was our first holiday season together. And I took her to a restaurant, just her and I on Christmas Eve. Just her and I to a prefix dinner that had a set start and end yeah, nice. because for me, the time boundaries are, I don't have, I can't do the whole day. I'm not coming at noon. I'm not going to be in the kitchen with you all day the way I used to and, and serve and cook. I'm not, mm -hmm. you want to come to dinner with me? I made reservations. I'll pick you up. I'll drop you off. I'll be done in 120 minutes. Right. At max. Yeah. And that's, that's the part of it, which is what is the, what is the amount that I'm willing to accept? Right. And, and really right. listening to that because you're, you're, you're at your edge at the 120 minutes. I mean, talk about your zone <laughs> of flexibility. That, that is your edge. You're, that's your full push, full court press. And then there is a, there's a safety that, that you're creating for yourself, a container that you're creating for yourself, a commitment to yourself that I will protect you. Like it's not, it's not my mom's job anymore. Now it's my job. My mom couldn't do it, but I'll, I'll, I will protect you. And that's how, that's how you're doing it for people. Like you actually, that's a question to ask ourselves during the holidays in terms of not just going into the automatic expectation, but really what are the boundaries that you need to set so that you can fully be there and be there willingly and with willing hands, open eyes, for the possibility of maybe a different experience. And if you're participating mindfully, you have the, the ability to craft the moment. You can influence the moment if you're participating yeah. mindfully. And that what you're saying, that commitment to myself, that's, that's actually an out loud conversation that I have while I'm doing my makeup. I'll say, hey, if you're not okay, we leave. Mm -hmm. If you get that feeling, I'll get you out of there. I promise I'll get you out of there. And I haven't let her down anymore since I made that commitment to Julia to treat her the way that she needs to be treated in order to feel physically, emotionally, and psychologically safe. So once I do that, then I can participate in the moment. And I feel what I see many children doing is trying to change the outcome or trying to change their parents' mind about something. And that's the part where I'm going to close in saying you have a better chance of winning the lottery than you do of changing their mind. So if they say something, don't try to talk them out of how they feel. Just simply say, okay. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Did she, 
Right, the escalate. And where do you want to put your energy into trying to change an unchangeable mind or into setting clear boundaries for yourself that you will feel safe within so that you can fully be present? I mean, it's hard to set boundaries that require some degree of energy. And that's a better use of your energy. Then the child yeah. ego will take over mm -hmm. because the child was desperate to change their mind. The child was desperate to say, don't you see me? Can't you hear me? I'm trying to help you. The child was so desperate. The adult understands that I can't change that and I don't want to anymore. So I'm okay with you being you and me being me and not taking it personally because I know in my heart and soul now that all of her stuff wasn't about me. It wasn't about me. I know that now with every fiber of my being, it wasn't about me. Yeah. Well, that's a beautiful place to end on. Thank you, Julia, for your beautiful story. And thanks for the space. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's an inspiration for people will relate to bits and pieces, even though their stories are so different. There's a common humanity in our relationship with our parents. Right. The romance. Yeah. What a romance yeah. story yeah. of that mother. Right. <laughs> right. Right. All righty. Well, happy holidays. Good luck in that 90 minutes with your mom. <laughs> <laughs> Thank right. you. I'll, I'll ship you some. If you were closer, you would get so much food. I, I know. Just know I'm that. Missing out. <laughs> the eggplant that would be on your doorstep. Darn. Okay. Thank you. Happy, happy holidays to you too.